Good morning and welcome to this month's edition of our sustainability webinars. Now today we're looking at developing a sustainability roadmap. Now this session has been specifically designed, designed in response to the question that I get asked most often, and that is, where do we start? How do we tackle sustainability? Alila, you've talked about all these things. It's very overwhelming. We need a sustainability roadmap. Can you help? And um, so it's a specifically designed webinar in response to your questions over the last number of months. And I hope you find it really beneficial and useful. Of course, if you want to explore this specifically for your organization, please reach out and I would love to work with you and help you on this journey, a journey um, which I'm very passionate about. So welcome to today's webinar. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay respects to elders past and present. In Melbourne, I'm meeting or I am on the land of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation. And we also extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, I think by now you would know me, um, the crazy lady with South African accent. Can you believe it? I've been here more than 22 years and this accent is going nowhere. Um, I've got two passions around accounting standards, really love IFRS accounting standards, and the other one, um, you know, more and more um, falling in love with sustainability and sustainability um, disclosure standards. So if you look at our sustainability webinar series for 2024, it's already the third year that we're running our sustainability webinar series at BBO. Um, earlier in the year, we looked at latest developments. Last month, we've looked at activating sustainability at your organization. And today we take it a step further looking at a sustainability roadmap. Next month, we move on to carbon accounting and then we work through all the topics that eventually will end up um, in your IFRS S2 um, disclosures. Also, a special invitation, a face-to-face -face invitation or an invitation to a face-to-face -face event. We are running carbon accounting masterclasses. Um, I'm personally involved in each and every one of them. So we're running five face-to-face five -face sessions, Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, and Sydney. The first one is in Melbourne because that's my home city. On the 10th of May, we run it from nine to five. Um, and then in early June, we also run a virtual session for the whole day for all those people who maybe live in regional areas or couldn't make any of the face-to-face -face sessions. We do a, a virtual session as well. We adjust, uh, uh, amend the session slightly so it's interactive and group discussions in a virtual environment. So please register for these. Um, we've talked about carbon accounting a lot and you'll see in our roadmaps Carbon accounting is actually the starting point of most roadmaps, um, a very important part of every roadmap. And even if you're not driven through compliance, um, strategically, you should start to measure your carbon footprint, um, set targets, because we know your customers and investors and the people in your business will ask for this. So this is an invitation to join our carbon accounting masterclasses. Then, as you know, my other passion, IFRS accounting standards. We also run um, IFRS and corporate reporting monthly webinars. It's the eighth year that we've been running this at BDO. Um, and last week, we looked at the revenue recognition of refresher, IFRS 15. And next month, my absolute favorite of all favorites, and that is we look at um, IFRS 16 around lease accounting. Um, May is the one not to miss because we do an update on financial and sustainability reporting for inclusion in 30 June 2024 financial reports. So please mark that one and please feel free to invite your finance teams um, to join these webinars as well. So today's agenda. Um, 
we will look at a recap from our previous webinar, Activating Sustainability at your organization. Then we look at, so what is a sustainability roadmap? Uh, we look at a high level sustainability roadmap, and then we do a deep dive. Um, in our high level sustainability roadmap, you would have seen them before, or you would have seen the roadmap before. Uh, we have three project streams. And today I would like to unpack each project stream. So there's a detailed roadmap for each project stream, project stream one, two, and three. And then we pull it all together in a detailed overall sustainability roadmap. And then finally, how BDO can help. Now at BDO, um, we've got four core services around sustainability. And one of them is around carbon accounting or helping you to measure your carbon footprint, be assurance ready. So we'll talk about those services, but that's a little bit of a heads up. Big focus today on a roadmap, where to get started, how to execute, how to plan. So first things first, let's do a recap from a previous, from our previous webinar in February this year where we looked at activating sustainability at your organization. And we start with the, uh, the question, why are you and why is your organization exploring sustainability now? So why have you registered for these webinars? Why are you listening to all of this? What is driving you? And we've discussed that there could be two reasons and it could be either or both. The one is a strategic imperative that you realize strategically there's pressure on us to do this. There are sustainability risks that we have to mitigate. There are the sustainability opportunities that we would like to um, embrace, explore. So there's a strategic imperative. The other one is it could be a compliance imperative. Now that would be, we've got draft legislation around mandatory sustainability reporting. Um, it could be compliance around our customers or investors ask us to report certain information to them. Uh, maybe bank arrangements or loans include um, certain covenants or certain requirements. So one could argue it's a little bit of compliance as well. But I think the big compliance driver is mandatory sustainability reporting where we now have draft legislation. If we look at that strategic imperative, <clears throat> we've discussed in a great, we've discussed in great detail um, that the strategic imperative is all about access, that organizations are seeing in order to have or keep access to their capital or to get access to more capital, um, they need to um, address sustainability potentially have a sustainability strategy, have a sustainability roadmap. And capital is broad. It could be equity, it could be debt. Markets is another one, access to markets, access to customers. Now, this is one that I think is a really hot driver at the moment. Whenever I speak to clients, they say, our customers are demanding information. Our customers want more information. Um, and it's always interesting to try and understand why they are asking, are they driven by strategic imperative or compliance um, comparative? Compliance could be that they're a subsidiary of a European entity that have mandatory reporting, et cetera. But the conversation with customers is a big one uh, at the moment. And then the third one is, is access to people to work in your business, people who align with your values. Um, another really important one, people want to know that culturally we're a fit, um, you know, it, it, culturally they're a fit at an organization and sustainability is such a big part of culture. Um, or is culture a part of sustainability? You know, that's a, a little bit of a debate for over a glass of wine. So strategic imperative, access to capital markets and people. Then we talked about that compliance imperative and can have a lot of angles, but in Australia, the one that's really driving the conversation is that on the 12th of January, um, Australian Treasury um, or Australian government Treasury have issued draft legislation where they are proposing to mandate climate reporting in Australia. 
And that climate reporting is um, some amendments to IFRS S2 being made by the Australian Accounting Standards Board. But a big part of that is carbon accounting, carbon footprint, um, climate risk assessment, which includes risks and opportunities, um, climate resilience, scenario analysis, financial, financial impacts on the financials, etc. So this compliance imperative um, it's still draft. We're waiting for final legislation. Um, personally, I expect the legislation by June, July um, at the earliest. Um, but currently, they're thinking if you're a Group 1 entity, um, it will be mandatory reporting from FY25. So years beginning on or after 1 July 2024, which is just a few months away, which will mean 30 June 2025 reporting. Um, then a two-year gap for Group 2 and another year gap for, for um, Group 3. Now, I know BDO, also Chartered Accountants Australia, New Zealand, CPA, um, and other people have provided strong feedback to Treasury about that mandatory implementation date for 1 July 2024 for Group 1 entities. Um, you know, we don't have uh, legislation around sustainability reporting, around auditing standards, independence, um, we don't have the final legislation, so it seems a bit unfair to get them to do reporting from 1 July if they don't know exactly what to report. Um, and therefore, you know, a number of organisations have, have provided that feedback to Treasury. Um, I'm hoping um, that there will be a bit of a pushback, uh, but obviously we, we have to prepare for a 1 July 2024 date. So that is the the starting point. Why would you activate? Why are you interested in it? Now we've done the presentation, you've listened to all of this, um, you've listened to these webinars, you've done your own research and reading, and you're thinking, wow, where do I start? So this is an elephant, this is a monster, um, and we have to tackle this. How do we eat this elephant? It's, it's bit by bit. Um, so let's just step back and say, so what is a roadmap or what is a sustainability roadmap? Why is everybody asking for this? Um, I think let's keep a definition short, sharp. I think a roadmap is where you visualize your sustainability strategy. Um, and you make your sustainability strategy crystal clear to all stakeholders within and outside the organization. Because some stakeholders internally, some stakeholders externally might ask you what's going on, what's the plan, how are we going to tackle this? As so a make it crystal clear. Now, I love a roadmap um, because it's like a plan on a page. You can see it all on one page. You can use it to track progress. You can communicate what the plan is. But I like the plan on a page. And you'll see my roadmaps always have a lot of color because as you would know by now, I love decision trees. I love diagrams. I love color. Um, so it's, it's a really handy way to express a lot of the things in our head, our thinking, our strategy around sustainability um, in a clear and concise way. So a roadmap really powerful. Um, you might say, you might say, why do I need this roadmap? I, I can think of a, a number of reasons, but definitely one of them, it's important to clearly outline what you want to achieve. Uh, I think it's really important that early on, if we've got a clear roadmap and we explain it, distribute it internally within an organization, but also externally for stakeholders, that we could get early buy-in on what we want to do. People can see the, the end game. They can see the plan to get to the end game. They can see their role, how they contribute, when they contribute, and potentially the importance of this. Um, you will manage stakeholder expectations from the get-go. So all the stakeholders who are asking, we will say, listen, you've asked for targets. Our roadmap is as follows. We're going to first have a baseline measurement of our carbon footprint. Um, maybe we're going to start with scope one and two. Then you'll see on this timeline when we tackle scope three. And after that, we're going to set targets. So yes, we, we don't have a target yet. Don't hold it against us. We've got a plan to get to a target. And this is the plan. 
Um, so I think a lot of customers, um, investors um, who ask these questions start by asking, do you have a plan? If you have a plan, what's the plan? Um, do you have a carbon footprint number? If you don't have one, when will you have one? Do you have a target? If you don't have a target, when can we expect to see a target? And then the final one on this slide, which is really important to me, is accountability. Um, I love the word accountability. Um, and I think it's really important that this project roadmap allows stakeholders internal and external, also ourselves, it allows the board, it allows our senior management executives to track progress, to see clearly on one page how we're progressing, but also for us who are delivering this to track and report progress. Um, so a, a project roadmap, uh, a sustainability roadmap, incredibly important. Now, there's a lot of ways we can do with a roadmap and we can put it together, we communicate it. Um, and I've given you some examples here that we use at BDO. And it depends on the complexity you're dealing with on you know, how a brief or detailed roadmap you need. Sometimes uh, for the same thing, we use different versions because maybe the board want a, a brief a roadmap. Maybe the executives want a more detailed one. Maybe the team want more uh, a roadmap that looks like a project plan. So a few examples could be something like this. Um, this could be breaking it by month, by week, exactly what we'll be doing. I personally love this one um, because you can see here um, on a daily basis or weekly basis or monthly basis, however you want to do it at the top. You can have all your tasks, all your phases, and you can see when certain phases is planned to happen. And, and then we can tick it off as we go. So I really like this particular one. And then I think this one is, you know, um, for me, the, um, the ultimate one. You've got your months, you've got your weeks, and if you've got different phases, a phase A, B, and C, you can see how the different phases somewhat run concurrently, how different projects within different phases run concurrently. Um, you can see when deadlines are, et cetera. So just some examples on how a roadmap can be constructed to be meaningful. I love this one um, for, um, because I love the colors. And I love the fact that the different phases, phase A, B, and C are ring-fenced. And you can see within each phase the different projects potentially. There's various different ways to do it. This is another iteration. And looking at this one personally, this is just me. It's not enough color for me. The red is good. We can see when the deadlines are, that is good. Um, but I would prefer to see more color. And, and I think this works well if it's just one project. So, if we come back to sustainability, we've talked about a lot of content. What would a high level, so this is high level, sustainability roadmap look like? It's high level because we look at years. So we say for the um, 30 June 2024 financial report, sustainability report, this is what should be done by 30 June 2024 or in respect of the 30 June 2024 period. And then we say for the next financial year, FY25, that what have to be done and what has to be done for 30 June 26. So it gives us some idea the rollout over the three years. It gives us some idea on what will be mandatory in various financial years and the sub projects that have to be conducted um, in the various um, years in order to get ready. So if it's in a wide block, it is a, a, a trial run, it's getting ready, it's preparation. If it's a green block, we have to mandatorily report it. Um, this is for group one entities, so it's driven by compliance. Um, we've got three project streams, our carbon footprint measurement stream, our climate <coughs> related disclosure stream, um, and at the bottom we've got our general sustainability um, related disclosures or strategic stream, um, IFRS S1. Um, 
you can see here um, for each project stream, there's already some kind of flagging of what sub projects could be. In, in project stream one, we could look at scope one and two and scope three separately. Um, we could look at climate related disclosures. You might look at the TCFD recommendations first for FY24, um, but you could have at the same time a gap analysis around IFRS S2 and Australian Sustainability Reporting Standards. Um, and strategically, um, <coughs> we've got an activation strategy that have uh, five steps. And how do you space those steps? You could do all five steps in the same year or over time, and then potentially we'll have mandatory reporting of that strategic stakeholder engagement, materiality assessment in FY26. So this is very high level. And often when I present to boards, um, to CEOs, CFOs, this, this slide really resonates with them because it's a plan on a page, high level, they can see how this comes into play. And as I often say, if you are driven by compliance, you'll start at the top with carbon and then go to climate. If you're driven by strategy, you'll start at the bottom. Um, a lot of clients that we're working with are running streams one and three at the same time because there's a compliance and strategic imperative and then they go to the climate related disclosures, uh, risk assessment, etc. So if we take that as our starting point, how can we unpack each project stream? Because you would, you would agree with me, that's a very high level roadmap. It's a conversation starter. But then we have to say, let's fine tune this roadmap. And there's different ways we can fine tune it. Sorry, I'll just quickly go back. Um, one way to fine tune is, is we can look at each, at each project stream separately and do a deep dive on each project stream, which I'll try and do today. Another way that you would like to fine tune this for your organization to make it real is to not just say, this is what we'll do in FY 24, 25, 26. Uh, you might want to add a five year or 10 year perspective, number one, but also for every year, let's break it down per quarter. Or maybe you want to break it down per month. Maybe you want to break it down per week. Right, so how do we take this plan and break it down per quarter or per month or per week, whatever is suitable for your organization. And then others have said, Aleta, we want to have a little bit of a longer term view. What will this look out over, look like over the next five years? Um, as we've previously said, and this is not to alarm you, um, in Europe, they already have 12 sustainability reporting standards. Um, globally, we've got the two, IFRS S1, S2, and in Australia, it looks like we're only going to have the climate-related disclosures shortly, so Australia Sustainability Re Reporting Standard 2. So the one in Australia, globally, is already two, in Europe, is 12. So we are looking at accelerated timelines here. Um, we, I would expect us to go from our existing one to Europe's 12 within a number of, let's say, three to five years. Um, and then all the topics that have to be covered, I would say, within the next 10 years. So this is, um, you know, real fast standard setting as to compare to what we've seen with um, um, IFRS accounting standards. So let's look at that detailed roadmap for Project Stream 1. Um, so this is an extract. What does Project Stream 1 look like? We're looking at carbon footprint measurement. You've decided this is an important project for you for various reasons. Um, you know, usually you start with your initial calculation. It could be reported internally only to certain stakeholders, uh, only in 25 potentially in the annual report. Um, we might then say after we've done initial calculation of scope one and two, maybe just set targets for scope one and two. Um, and then an insurance readiness assessment is really important. Not just do we have a number, but our auditors who provide assurance will be able to um, provide assurance. And then scope three, it's a really difficult task. We start with a lot of estimation, often spend based and then we fine tune it over time. 
let's do a bit of a deep dive on this. How can we unpack this into a more detailed roadmap? So when we look at carbon accounting or the measurement of a carbon footprint, we use three gated stages. So we start with boundary setting, then we look at the measurement of scope one and two, and then we look at the measurement of scope three. So this is just to measure your baseline carbon footprint. Um, a lot of entities jump over the boundary setting and get stuck because um, it's really important that you understand which organizations is in, which facilities is in the carbon footprint, which properties, which assets, uh, super important. And once you know everything that's within the boundary, to divide them between scope one, scope two, and scope three, and all the categories within all these um, scopes, super important. A lot of entities jump to measuring scope one and two, don't look at the boundary setting, and when we then come in as auditors or assurance providers or third party reviewers, we would say, hang on, um, you've missed certain entities, you've double counted certain aspects, um, why did you not include contractors? Why did you not include leased assets? We're not saying it's always be in, but what's your justification? Um, a, a critical principle is how is the boundary for the measurement of your carbon footprint similar or different to your financial reporting boundary? Um, so that's an important one. You, you can't jump over it. Um, then scope one and two. Um, Again, this is important to understand what the legislative requirements are. Um, IFRS S2 says we have to use the greenhouse gas protocol unless your jurisdiction mandates another measurement method. In Australia, we have exactly that. In Australia, the Australian Accounting Standards Board is proposing in their exposure draft that they're going to say you have to use the ENGA scheme in the first instance. And then if it doesn't deal with a particular aspect, then you go to the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, so scope one and two would be covered by ENGA, most of it, if not everything. And then scope three will go to the greenhouse gas protocol. Some clients are doing their measurement just by looking at the greenhouse gas protocol and not considering ENGA for scope one and two. Others are using different measurement protocols. And the question is, is that suitable if in Australia they're going to force you down anger and greenhouse gas protocol? So again, understanding the lay of the land, understanding the, the, the jurisdictional and global requirements, coming up with a methodology, um, clearly articulating the methodology, and then towards the end, go and look for the data and do the actual calculations. So people are rushing through some important parts. And then scope three, of course, there's a lot of pain involved in scope three. Um, for each of the 15 categories, so one, which category are you in? And then for each category, there's a various uh, methods that you could use, which is the best? And how do you use, um, how do you initially maybe use a method and slowly over time move to the best, most accurate method? Um, and that's a journey within scope three itself. So carbon footprint, we've got a three stages. Then when we look at that inventory boundary, we said there's two steps. You set your organizational boundary, which entities, facilities, assets are in or out. And you set your operational boundary. Operational boundary is talking about, is it scope one, scope two, or scope three? Organizational boundary is the one where you compare the boundary with your financial reporting boundary. Operational boundary is where you establish its scope one, scope two, scope three, <coughs> and which category within scope one, scope two, scope three. And then if you look at that operational boundary where we look at the scope, scope one, two, three, how would we do that? We would identify emissions associated with operations, We'll classify emissions as direct or indirect, direct scope one, indirect is scope two or scope three. And then in step three, we categorize the scope. So we look at um, within scope one, we've got four categories. Within scope three, we've got 15 categories and we get all of that right. 
So you can see there are a lot of steps, a lot of overlay. And for me, um, I'm a, I am like big picture and I need to understand how all these steps fit together before I can even get started. So I often do a lot of reading, a lot of thinking. How do I put this in a sensible process? Because I've given you a number of slides here saying gated process, uh, two steps, here again a number of steps. How do we make sense of it? And um, when you actually get to the measurement of scope one, two, and three, you move past the boundary. Again, we've got five steps, you know, identify sources of emissions, select a calculation approach, collect data, choose emission factors, apply calculation tools, roll out. All of this we've discussed in our webinars last year. So I just wanted to show you that I've got four slides here talking about different processes, steps. I think an important part of the roadmap is to try and bring it together. Um, when we talk of, about measuring your carbon footprint, please don't forget about setting targets after you've got a baseline, after um, you've got a baseline for scope one, two, and three. Now we have to set targets. And to set targets, you know, we have to get the commitment from senior management. We have to decide on a target type, if it's absolute or an intensity target. We have to decide on a boundary, et cetera. So is it just scope one and two or is it scope one, two and three? Again, you can see we've got 10 steps. So what I've tried to do and say, from a carbon accounting perspective, for Project Stream 1, there's a lot of things that have to happen. Um, and I've showed it to you in a lot of different slides here, and I've taken it from a lot of presentations I've done over the last year. Let's put them on one page. And let's say, if I look at Project Stream 1, if I want to measure my carbon footprint and then set targets in order to reduce our carbon footprint, what are the activities that I have to do? Phase A, I have to do boundary setting. And that you can divide in two steps, organizational boundary, operational boundary. Operational boundary, you've got three steps in that, A, B, C. Then you move on to phase B. You have the measurement of scope one and scope two. In order to do that, you have to identify the sources of scope one and two um, emissions. You have to select a calculation approach for each of scope one and scope two categories. Then you have to go and collect the data. Then you have to choose emission factors, which is a different ball game altogether. Then you apply your calculation tools and then you roll it up at a corporate level. Then you move on to scope three. And for scope three, a similar process, identify the sources of emissions um, and there will be 15 categories. Select a calculation approach for each of the 15 categories. Um, because it's not um, the same three or four calculation approaches that's available for all 15 categories. Each category have their own um, number of calculation approaches. Then we collect the data, we choose emission factors, etc. Can you see to jump to collecting data, phase B, step three, or phase C, step three, is the wrong way to do measurement of your carbon footprint? There's a lot of work that have to be done outside, and then we collect data, and then we have to do a lot of work around choosing mission factors and bringing it together. And then right on the right-hand side, we have phase D, setting targets. Now that we've got a baseline for scope one and two and three, how do we set targets? So what I've tried to do here in, in, in my very colorful fashion, I like to be colorful, um, I've tried to bring all the previous slides together on one slide and say, measuring my carbon footprint and then trying to reduce it through setting targets and monitoring it, this is what I have to do. So when I have it all on this slide, I can see the big picture for Project Stream 1. And then I was thinking, now we have to think, are these steps that follow consecutively so it's a, is it a gated process, which I think it is, or are there certain phases that can run concurrently? Or maybe there are certain steps within a phase that can run concurrently. And that's the challenge. 
this is everything I have to do. You have to do phase A. And then only can you look at phase B. And in phase B, you have to do steps one and two before you can collect the data. And, and, we, and once you've got the data, you then start to think, what emission factors do I put, apply to these specific data items? Maybe phase B and C could run concurrently because you can look at scope one, two, and three at the same time. But phase A is first, then phase B and C potentially concurrently. And then once we've got a baseline for scope one, two, and three, we could look at phase D, setting targets. So I hope this gives you some idea of all the activities in that very simple, we go back, um, very simple project stream. Um, one, measuring your carbon footprint. This is not good enough. This is just a summary of all the activity. It, it clarifies our thinking, right? But I think what we have to do next is to convert it in a detailed roadmap where we have, and I've used similar colors to the previous slide, we have phase A, the boundary setting, and I've copied across the, the sub steps within phase A. And then I've got phase B, measurement of scope one and two, <clears throat> and that's the blue bit. And then I've got phase C um, for measurement of scope three emissions, and then we'll go on to phase D, target setting. Now, I didn't put everything here, not enough place on the slide, but what you can see here is that if we put all the phases in the first column, and then on the right-hand side, we have the various weeks. Let's say we start this week as week one, um, next week, week two, Oh, and then I've got another week two. Let's make it week three from the 8th of April. We can plot out our weeks, our months, our quarters. We can now start to think. We're going to do boundary setting first. Maybe that's going to take a week or two. Um, and we know we have to do that first. And then we're going to do uh, step one uh, and step two of phase B because we have to look at identifying sources of emissions, calculating um, set, collecting a, selecting a calculation approach. And only then, maybe in six weeks' time, do we get to collecting data for scope one and two, um, et cetera. So if we start to plot all of this out, so if you take everything from the previous slide, you take everything from this slide and you put it into one document with phase A, B, C, and D, on the left hand side, but not just the phase, every sub project within the phase or sub activity, um, you could start to map out how long it's going to take you to do your measurement of your carbon footprint. So this is what we do and we work with clients to understand how long it will take us to do certain parts based on complexity, based on involvement by the client or whether we're doing everything, how long it will take them to collect data etc. So this would be a detailed roadmap just for project stream one around measurement of your carbon footprint. And now we do this for every project stream. So if we look at a detailed um, roadmap for project stream two, what is project stream two? Maybe we should just discuss a bit. Um, you know, TCFD recommendations, there's 11 recommendations. Um, I think a gap analysis of that uh, would be a, a good thing to do. Uh, it would also be good to do a gap analysis around IFRS S2 because um, that influences what we'll ultimately have in Australia, Australian Sustainability Reporting Standard 2. Um, and if you're a global entity, you'll have to comply with both. We would want to know whether there's differences between the two and to what extent we're ready. Um, when you look at the gap analysis of IFRS S2 and Australian Sustainability Reporting Standard 2, um, it will show you all the items you have to disclose. And then the thinking is, do we have the information we have to disclose? Do we have a carbon footprint? Do we have targets? Do we have it in the granularity required by IFRS S2? Um, have we conducted the climate risk assessment 
again, with the granularity that will be required for disclosures. Have we prepared a scenario analysis and considered the impact of our climate risk assessment, of our carbon footprint, um, of all these risks and opportunities on our financial statements? Um, we will, in future webinars, explore each of these in great detail. We have last year already looked <coughs> at the TCFD recommendations because that's something important for 30 June 2024 disclosure. But all of these aspects we will just explore in great detail. I'll give you an example. You know, if we think about unpacking this, how many projects are required as part of this project stream? And look at this. Um, initially, we can see already there's a number of projects around gap analysis of the three documents, climate risk assessment, um, which is a big deal, scenario analysis. So that's just, and um, just quickly looking at it, we can see that when you do the gap analysis, look out for the projects you need to generate all those disclosures. If we come up with a number of projects, let's say in this project stream, we come up with six projects. I'm just guessing. What is the methodology for each project? What are the steps within each project? And again, can these projects run at the same time or do they have to run consecutively? So for example, if you want to do a climate risk assessment, this is the five-step approach that we use to conduct a climate risk assessment. So step one, you identify the climate risks and you have to look at the impact, the likelihood across the short-term, medium-term, long-term. And you have to think what is short-term, what is medium-term, what is, what is long-term for your business. It doesn't have to be one to five, five to 10, 10 plus. Um, so we look at climate risk and we assess um, impact likelihood and you have to do it over short term, medium term, long term. Then in step two, we discuss those transition and physical risks with the leadership team, subject matter experts in the business to decide on their materiality. Um, then we look at assessing the control environment. So what do we already have in place? Um, around key climate risks, what controls do we have, um, can we manage these risks, what controls do we have, how adequate are they, are there any gaps. Then we move on considering the impact of the risks, the controls, and what it would, how it would impact your risk register. And we wouldn't want a climate risk register to sit separate, has to be embedded in your enterprise risk register and framework. How do we do that? And finally, a report bringing it all together around your climate risk assessment. And your climate risk assessment do not only look at climate risks, it also looks at climate opportunities. And it doesn't only look at physical risk, it also looks at transitional risks. But you can see if a climate risk assessment is one of the projects within this project stream, this project has its own five steps as an example, and therefore each project will have steps that we have to factor into our sustainability roadmap. Um, and we'll explore all those steps um, in the remainder of this year. We'll look at them all in great detail. I've just given the climate risk assessment as an example, and I've fully explored the measurement of carbon footprint. In the third one, we're looking at a detailed roadmap for project stream three. Now that is the strategic project stream, or if you look at it from a compliance perspective, it would be the IFRS S3, do a stakeholder engagement, do a materiality assessment stream. So this is how we've articulated it as part of our overall roadmap. Um, we've said potentially in FY24, you activate sustainability strategy. So you do a current state assessment, you do a materiality assessment, or we call it a stakeholder engagement, same thing. I don't like the materiality assessment terminology because uh, I think it, it kind of confuses the concept of materiality with materiality in financial reports, right? So I like stakeholder engagement. Um, I think it's clearer, you identify gaps. And then maybe the next year, 
you commit to addressing the gaps and to measure certain items to address the gaps and you prepare a report and that report can be a formal report or just a report to stakeholders etc um, and then you can do an official IFRS S1 gap analysis to get ready for potential mandatory reporting. So that is, we know what the topics are, we know what the stakeholders said, we're trying to address it, but what do we have to report? What are the extensive disclosure requirements required? So this was the high level project stream three. Now I've previously explained for us to look at the strategic aspect um, we've created a checklist or a, a, a sustainability roadmap um, where we look at, you assess, you prioritize, you commit, you measure, you report, and then it's a continuous improvement. You can see these first five steps that I've got here is also the five steps that I've put in the high level roadmap for project stream three. I'm a, a person who likes consistency. I want things to speak to each other. Um, and th therefore you'll see these five steps already yeah. Um, but then I thought um, you would have seen in that checklist, and I've discussed it last month and in previous months, for each step, we've got sub steps where we say, how do you assess? You complete an initial review, etc. You identify the policies and procedures. You identify the metrics, etc. So for each step, we've got sub steps in this document and we try and explain it. So for each of these steps, there are sub steps. So for me, again, I thought let's bring it together, similar to what we've done for project stream one, the carbon footprint one. And I said, um, let's put in step one is assess, and it's got sub steps. Step two to prioritize has sub steps. Step three has sub steps. Um, and the same with step four. And again, if we look at the weeks and you can see I've made the same mistake. Uh, week three starting 8 April is week two again. You can see I've copied from my previous slide. Um, apologies for that, it should be week three, 8 April. But I've got three weeks to give you an idea how we can spread it out. So step one, um, if we're gonna start with that, um, you know, when are we doing it? Which week, how many weeks will it take? Can some of these things be done at the same time? Now, step one and step, step two, we often do at the same time. Because step one is you assess what we have in place currently. And at the same time, we do step two because we engage with stakeholders, that takes time. So let's say in six weeks time, we know what we currently have, plus we know what the stakeholders are saying. And then we move on to step three, and that is to do the gap analysis. So you have to do step one and two, before you can do step three, but you can do step one and two at the same time, for example. So again, you can convert um, that checklist into logical steps <coughs> and a roadmap. <coughs> I apologize for my coughing. I get overexcited. Um, so you can have a detailed roadmap for project stream three. So if we want a detailed overall roadmap <coughs> for sustainability, really what we want to do is we want to bring it all together. So that yellow block marked an A could be project stream one and everything we've done there. And the, the block, the yellow block marked project um, B could be our project stream two, uh, climate disclosures. And then a number C could be uh, what we've done around strategy. Um, so I think if we put it all together, um, you, you have a deep dive on each project stream and think about each project stream separately and then bring it together, map it. You can see where there are months that you are overcommitted. We can start to think, um, in certain months, we're doing a lot of things, but maybe it's different people doing those things, so it's okay. Um, but very important to bring all those project streams at a detailed level together in order to get the roadmap. You can now see that that first roadmap that I said the boards love, just looking at it on an annual basis, um, you can see why they love it. They've come, but this is what we're doing. 
they wouldn't want to see all this detail. It's too much detail and their heads will spin. But somebody responsible for execution, potentially the executive management would want to see it at this level of detail to have confidence that we can do it, we can meet our deadlines. So finally, how BDO can help you. Um, we've got four core services. So we do carbon accounting, measurement of carbon footprint, um, sustainability reporting, whether it's internal reporting, voluntary reporting, reporting in the annual report mandatory, we do all of that. We also do sustainability and decarbonisation strategy, roadmaps, pulling um, all these projects together. How do we manage all of this strategically? What does it mean for us? It's kind of carbon accounting is like project stream one, sustainability reporting, IFRS S2 is project stream two, and the strategy is project stream three. And then obviously our audit partners um, can provide assurance, not over work that we, BDO, have done, but work that other providers have done for you. Um, this is a little bit of a breakdown of how we've, we think about the different services. Um, and then we have do additional stuff. We do sustainable finance, sustainable communities, sustainable supply chain. Um, the previous slide is our core services, which aligns with that roadmap we've been discussing. Um, but we do additional things as well across industries. And, and these are the people you could contact to help you. So you can see I do carbon accounting, sustainability reporting and sustainability strategy, all three streams. Um, not everybody does all three streams, uh, but we can find somebody that do all three streams. These are just the partners and directors. There's a lot of people in our team that can help you. Um, and then if you look at sustainability assurance, that's our audit partners uh, that do that work. Uh, we often support them um, as subject matter experts, um, but my focus from an advisory perspective and our focus from an advisory perspective is carbon accounting, sustainability reporting, sustainability strategy. Um, our regular insights, last week we've published sustainability news for March. Uh, 2024, you can register to receive those. We have ongoing learning webinars, e-learning, um, TCFD recommendations available on our website and in our learning hub, so you can go there. Um, and then finally, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you found um, this discussion around the sustainability roadmap useful um, and informative. Um, you know, really, the the most the, the question I get asked most is how do we deal with this? What does the roadmap look like? How do we execute? Um, so the board, I do a presentation to the board. They say we have to do it. We know we have to do it from a compliance strategic perspective. But a letter, how do we how do we do it? And I think a roadmap would be really powerful. If you need help, please reach out to me. I would love to explore this further and discuss this with you. Um, finally. We're going into a long weekend. Isn't it the most amazing weekend? Um, so I hope you get to spend some time with your family and your friends over this long weekend. Um, and um, for me as a Christian, this weekend has a particular meaning. And, and um, um, for those of you where, where it's a particular meaning for you, an important meaning, I hope you enjoy the celebration of that as well. And we'll speak next month. Goodbye.